Amen. Isn't it good to be in the house of God today? Amen. Think about the grace of God because that's what we're going to be singing about this morning. Isn't God's grace wonderful? Yeah. For you're saved by grace. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's lift our voices up and sing and praise. A wonderful song. I love this song. You can't help but to sing it. Look for grace of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We can rejoice. If it wasn't for his grace, you and all, we'd all be looking to hell, wouldn't we? But you and I get to spend eternity in heaven because of his wonderful grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your saving grace. We thank you, Father, that you are the one that has brought freedom to our lives, freedom from sin, from the shackles of death. And Lord, you have given us this wonderful grace we aren't deserving, for we don't deserve that sweet grace that you've given us, Lord, that promise to heaven. And, Lord, we, we are so thankful today. And we worship you and give you the praise and glory in this service. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Please be seated.
Yeah.
All right. Thank you, choir, for that. Welcome, everyone who's here today with us. Welcome, everyone who's watching online. We're glad that you're with us. If you're visiting with us or you have a prayer request to share, there are connection cards on the table with the blue tablecloth. You can uh, fill those out and just drop it in the offering box, and we'll send that out on the prayer list. And we're glad for everyone who's watching with us online. You can watch either through our website, through our YouTube channel, through our Facebook page. Brother David is going to continue his end time study. So it will be the next part coming up this Saturday. I'm, I'm sorry we had a little mix up on the uh, date there, but that's this coming Saturday, Saturday, May 8th at 10 a.m. There is a sign up list on the table with the white tablecloth. If you want to bring something, you don't have to bring something. If you just want to uh, attend and listen, that's fine. But if you would like to bring something, there's some suggestions. Uh, on the sign-up list if you want to bring an item with that. So that'll be uh, here this Saturday at 10 if you want to continue in the next part of his end-time study. Looking forward to Mother's Day uh, next week for our service and special things we'll have with that. And then summer's already coming here, and so we've got uh, camp, uh, teen camp and junior camp on the way. So uh, the teen camp is going to be June the 7th through the 10th. And uh, there are sign-up forms. They don't have to be in for a couple of weeks, but if you want to go ahead and grab a sign-up form, they're also on the table with the white tablecloth, and there has to be a permission form, all the deals with that. And thankfully, this year with camp, that uh, we've already had several families that have donated significant amount already this year to cover the camp fees, so we're going to be able to take our teenagers without having to worry about cost or without having to, this is this price or whatever. So a blessing to those families who have done that. So yeah, if you're ages 12 to 19 and you're interested in going to camp, uh, grab a sign-up form and uh, we'll go here in a couple weeks. So uh, before the kids go, we got 40 days of prayer. We're continuing on with that. So Normally, day 40 would be this Friday, uh, but it's looking like we're going to need to extend that a couple more days, 44 days, 45 days. So, uh, again, the address here, 431 West Ocotillo. Uh, take your phone, put your alarm in there for 431. Just take a minute to pray, consider something to fast, and we'll just continue that. Hopefully, Lord willing, we'll have an um, uh, announcement for the church on that at the end of service next week. We can give some more details on where we are in that step. So kids can go ahead next door and enjoy their kids' class. I live each day in victory because of the one who lives in me. I found every promise he ever made, Jesus will keep. Walk by my side in deserts dry loved me and held me when i cried so let me sing you one more song in case i leave i know how i made it i know how i made it i made it by god's amazing grace steps that are slower now have taken each one by faith standing on jordan stormy shore i'll lift my trembling voice once more i know how i made it i know how i made it i made it by god's God's children are leaving one by one Passing this way and going home Signs of the time reveal we don't have very long But each one who stands up on this shore Waving goodbye as they rejoice. Glory to God, we'll leave here singing. 
that same sweet song. I know how I made it. I know how I made it. I made it by God's amazing grace. Steps that are slower now have taken each one by faith. Standing on Jordan's stormy shore, I'll lift my trembling voice once more. I know how I made it. I know how I made it. I made it by grace. Isn't God's grace wonderful? It truly is. Um, we can't, we really could not have a day of grace without all of us singing Amazing Grace. Isn't that a wonderful song? And, but I have a special uh, praise today. I looked back and we got a message not long ago, Sam and I, about uh, Charlie and Sharon Moore. And I know Charlie would never want to be pointed out, but God showed you some wonderful grace, Charlie. And I'm so grateful you're here with us. He had cancer and God has been healing him up. He's clean today. Like he told me earlier, he said, I might not be clean in a month from now. Who knows if it'll come back. But today, he's resting in God's wonderful grace. Praise God for that. Let's sing if you would. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. On that third stanza, it says, when we've been there, 10,000 years. Amen. Won't it be great to be in heaven? It's his grace that is going to carry us to heaven. And I'm thankful today that on March 19, 1980, in Rota, Spain, uh, E3 in the Navy, cursed, lived the sinful life that God called me forward. And it was that, that evening I got saved. Did Jesus save my soul? And I have his grace today because of that. Amen? Let's sing with me if you would. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Isn't God's grace wonderful? Leave it on. Leave it on. Yeah, I'll leave it on. <laughs> brother Mike. You're up, brother. Just don't cry like I did. Okay. I'll try not to cry like Dale did. <laughs> he told me not to cry. So, Well, as Dale has mentioned, and all the songs are about the grace of God, right? And um, I can tell you that I feel the grace of God every day in many different ways, you know. And gosh, a year and a half ago, I was laying in a hospital bed. Dale, I'm starting to cry. Anyway, I was pretty much out of gas and uh, some back surgery and diet changes later. I, here I am. I'm able to stand and sing for you all. I hope that uh, I have a song about grace also, and uh, it's uh, called Grace Became Amazing. 
I think it's a beautiful song, and I hope it's a blessing to you. So. I remember how it felt When I heard about the cross And I was thinking to myself How could I be worth that greater cost And as the story was unfolding I heard a voice like I had never known That's when mercy called my name That's when love broke every chain When His blood covered my sin And my life began changing Grace became amazing I have walked so many miles I'm no stranger to the rain But I'm learning through each trial healing cannot come without the pain and on the days I feel defeated God takes me back to one day long ago that's when mercy called my name That's when love broke every chain When His blood covered my sin And my life began changing And grace became amazing When hope was lost, my soul was bound when my strength was running out That's when mercy called my name That's when love broke every chain When His blood covered my sin And my life began changing Yes, my life began changing And grace became amazing when mercy called my name. What a great truth. Thank you, Mike, for sharing that song. How many of you would rather be here than in the best hospital in town? Would you raise your hand? Good deal. Um, uh, we've got some folks that are watching from Oklahoma, uh, Alan and Marty Burrow, and I don't know if you've had a chance to do it yet or not, whoever's back there. But if you can take some pictures of the congregation, turn, turn the camera around, I uh, want you to wave to Alan and Marty and uh, uh, do that. Can you, can you swift, swift that around real quick and let, uh, there's, okay, these, these folks over here, all right, and uh, turn back around uh, the middle section, uh, they'll get it in just a minute, and uh, some, some of you owe the money, I think, and that's what they're, they're looking for you. So, 
All right, I go around the other way. Here we go. All right, now right here in the middle. Okay, and then over on the right. There we go. We got the hope you found the hope you found the folks that owe you the money. And I, so uh, anyway, just tease it. Uh, no, they commented last week about uh, the, the guys flipped the camera around and showed pictures of you guys. And, and they said, we, we'd like to see the congregation. We, we feel like we know the people there, even though we haven't seen them. So, uh, so they've turned the camera around, so don't be picking your nose or anything, because they may, they may be doing that again, okay? So uh, take your Bibles, please, and turn to Romans chapter 15. We have two more chapters in the book of Romans, so we may be out by December out of the book of Romans, I hope. But uh, if you're able to stand, would you please stand with me as we read, beginning with verse 1. We're talking about bearing the failings of the weak. And notice verse 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the and the word there for scruples means failings or weaknesses of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. When we're talking about edification, we're talking about building one another up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the creeds I think it's the Westminster Creed says that man's chief end is to glorify God. That our main purpose and our reason for being here is to glorify God in our lives and in our bodies to honor him. And so this passage talks about doing that as we deal with one another. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in this place. Would you speak to our hearts from your word? May the Spirit have his way in our lives. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Please be seated. This passage shows us that God is glorified when we think about other people. It's kind of really easy to kind of think about yourself, right? How many of you are thinking about where you're going to eat lunch after service is over, right? Yeah. Yeah, we think about ourselves. We want, we want the best for us, and uh, we want that. But we're not to focus on everything else, or we're supposed to focus on everybody else rather than on ourselves. Other New Testament verses uh, express this same idea. If you'll notice in Galatians 6.22, the Bible says to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. When we hear of a need that you have, that someone has, we try our best to try to let folks know about that need so you can pray and help bear another's burden who is going through a tough time. Uh, how many of you have ever had more month left at the end of the money? Would you? Okay. We, we go through things like that, that that is a burden sometimes, and we want to help lift the load and carry the load. We bear one another's burdens. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more. To the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. And I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. In other words, Paul is saying that he tries to identify with whoever he's around in order that he might reach them for the Lord Jesus Christ. Last night we had a young couple who broke down in their motor home and they parked out here. And uh, so I came and asked to see if I could be of some assistance in some way. And I told them, uh, I said, can, can you move it? If, uh, if you can, 
if you move back over here next to this building, there's the, the only 110 outlet we have, I think, on the outside of the building is right over here on building 200. And I said, you're able to uh, park there and stay there overnight till you kind of get things settled. And they said, we would really appreciate that. Uh, their names, uh, Ren and Jessica. And so uh, Ren said, told me, he said, uh, I about died and God raised me up. And I said, well, you're welcome to stay here. If there's anything that I can do for you uh, while you're here, let me know. I invited them to come to church today. They didn't come to church. But anyway, we tried to be a blessing to them during their time of need and their time of burden. We tried to identify with who they are in order to try to help them. That's what you and I are supposed to do. We're to bear the burdens and make ourselves a servant to others. Philippians 2.4 Let each of you look not only on his own interest, but also the interest of others. That's We're supposed to look out for other people. 1 Corinthians 10.24 Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Now when you put all this together... We could be saying the law of Jesus Christ is that a person who's been saved, the saved man or woman, has been set free from the chains of sin, and he becomes a bond slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, he's to live as Christ in the world, and Jesus gave himself for others. We are to do the same thing and give ourselves to meet the needs of others. We are to serve God by serving other people. You can't get any better in serving God than when you serve someone else. Now that someone else may be your children at home who need your instruction and need your guidance and need your teaching. It could be that neighbor that lives uh, next door or across the street that you might go over and try to help them with their trimming of their trees or their hedge or whatever, you know, rearranging their rocks on their yard, whatever it might be, since we live in Arizona. You know, when you go to meet the needs of another person, you are serving Jesus when you do that. Jesus said that the basis of, of future judgment would be the way that men treated each other. I want you to notice this passage in Matthew chapter 25. It's a long passage, so hang with me, but listen carefully to what these words say. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Now notice this. All nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from the other as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. Now, do you all know anything about sheep? A few of you do. Um, sheep can kind of get off by themselves. If they wander and uh, they kind of eat with their heads down all the time and they kind of wander around. Goats, uh, we, my dad traded for a hundred Angora goats. Why anybody would trade anything for goats, I'll never understand. But anyway, we had a hundred of them at one time. They were these long-haired Angora goats. And my brother, Kurt, he was about three, he said, and they had bended eels. <laughs> they had horns, you know. One of them happened to be a pet that was born on Christmas Day. And, of course, the folks named him Chris Kringle. And Chris Kringle thought he lived in the house. And he would come in, and, and he would get inside the house, and he'd get jump up on the beds, just act like he owned the place. <laughs> and uh, Now, I can tell the difference from a sheep and a goat. In fact, I'm going to tell the difference in this congregation right now, because we got sheep and goats right here, right? So I'm going to line you up. No, I, I can't do that. See, y'all look like sheep today. Now, I don't know, but there may be somebody that looks like a sheep, but you're really a goat because you don't know Jesus. And see, I can't tell that. The only, reason, the only way you and I can tell, because we can't see into a person's life and their spirit and their conscience, we don't know, but the only way you and I can tell whether each other is a sheep or a goat is by how we live. Hello? 
You know, you see an animal that has feathers like a duck and waddles like a duck and web feet like a duck and got a bill like a duck and quacks like a duck. Pretty much a duck, amen? So the way we tell is by the way we live. Now notice, Jesus can tell. And he will separate them one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Verse 33, and he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left hand. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Boy, what a great day that will be. Amen. For I was hungry. Notice this. And you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Now notice what they will say. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? Now notice verse 40, and the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That person that's broken down by the side of the road, and you stop and say, Can I help you change the tire? That person who's struggling with getting uh, maybe something onto their shopping cart. And you walk up and say, ma'am, may I help you? You're serving Jesus when you do that. You're acting like a sheep when you do that. Hello? You're acting like a goat when you can't get in the spot on the pavement in the freeway that you want. Hello? Now listen. Then he'll also say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice that, that the fire was not prepared for us. It was prepared for the devil and those who followed him in the rebellion before the world was created. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty. And you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in naked and you did not clothe me sick. And in prison you did not visit me. And they will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The rest of this prophecy shows what happens to those who ignore those least of these. Those that you do not serve and those that you do not help. And we don't take opportunity to show Jesus to them. Boy, these will go away to everlasting punishment. Now, there are three things that I want you to see in this passage. First of all, I want you to notice that unselfishness is not natural. Did you ever see kids play together? And one of them gets a toy, and another kid wants it, and he'll go right up to that kid, grab that toy, mine. Mine. We, we are selfish by nature. We want what we want for us. The only one who knows Jesus and follows him will turn away from himself and move to serve others. And by the way, that is a supernatural transformation. If you have been touched by the Lord Jesus Christ and he has changed your life, you will move away from selfishness and turn to serve other people. Dr. Samuel Johnson said, To act from pure benevolence is not possible for finite beings. Human benevolence is mingled with vanity, interest, or some other motive. Unfortunately, that's the case. 
You know, some people think that they're somehow getting brownie points with God when they put their check in the offering plate and they have no desire to serve anybody else or to do anything else with what they have. They think as long as they put their check in the offering that that somehow smiles, God smiles on them and that eliminates them from having to serve others. That's not the case, folks. In fact, our lives are to be characterized by our love for one another. The difference between the man who belongs to Jesus and the man who does not is that the one who belongs to Jesus turns away from selfish desires and moves to serve other people. And by the way, there's lots of ways to do that. You remember in John 13, what we find in John 13, that they were in the upper room and they were, had been arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And a, a chore that they normally did when they entered a house, they did not do. They didn't wash their feet. And so what happens? Jesus gets a basin and a towel and he begins to kneel and wash the feet of the disciples one by one. And when he gets to Peter, he says, Lord, you're, you're not washing my feet. I mean, you're the Lord, you're the master, you're not doing... And Jesus said, if I wash you not, you don't have any part with me. And, he, and then Peter said, then Lord, give me a bath. Because I need it. And I think he was talking about his own weakness and his own failure. And he said, washing my feet's not going to fix me. I need a, a whole bath. And yet, at the same time, we're to wash the feet... Of another person. Think about that. That's very humbling. Do you know. That that's something. That free will Baptists practice. You say. Well, what do you do? We'll get basins and towels. And wash one another's feet. You say, that's kind of weird pastor. Yeah it is. Especially with COVID. <laughs> Put a little bleach in the water and it kills COVID. So. But, but it's something to kneel down and say, may I wash your feet? If you've never done that before, we're going to do that sometime before the year's out. And if you've never been to a feet washing service you ought to come just to watch. Because it'll take all the starch out of you. When you kneel and wash the feet. I mean, now listen, don't, don't misunderstand me. There's more ways to wash people's feet than by washing their feet. You may wash someone's feet by washing their car. That's a way to do that. There are other ways to wash a person's feet, to serve them. Do you understand what I'm saying? But Jesus said, if I've washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Check out John 13. That's your homework for this week, okay? Read John 13 and check it out. Now, let me go on. A believer knows that he's not his own. And that he's been bought with a price, the precious blood of the Lamb. And because of that, I want to serve other people. We've got some servants in our church that people who really love other people and who want to serve them. And I'm not going to take time to point them out, but we've got, you, you just watch around. You, you know we've got people who serve and are willing to serve. How wonderful to know that when I am in Christ... All men belong to me, and I can serve them. I can serve anyone. The truth is, the world cannot see it because they've never met Jesus. But there's a second thing that I want you to see. Not only is unselfishness not natural, but we are unloving apart from Jesus Christ. We are unloving apart from Jesus Christ. Unselfishness is accomplished by the power of Jesus at work in our hearts. But without Jesus, we are unloving toward others. I believe that the Lord Jesus 
is the entire is the author of the entire Bible, even the Old Testament. Amen. I believe through the Spirit of God, He moved upon men to write the words that we have for us. And the only way we can become loving toward other people is through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives that begins once we repent of our sin and trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Several hundred years before Christ, there was a a Greek dramatist named uh, Menander. And he wrote these words. He said, The man who first proposed to support the poor increased the number of the miserable. It would have been simpler to let them die. Can you imagine that? That somebody would think that way? Now here's the thing. Moses wrote that love and charity are virtues that are to be sought after. That we're to try to do our best to help people. Look in Deuteronomy 24, 19. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and the Lord your, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Pastor Matt talked about the fact that they left the corners of the field for those who were poor so they could come like Ruth, who would glean in the fields. David said it this way in Psalm 41, 1, Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in a time of trouble. The, the man who looks out for those who are in need and serves them, God will take care of him when he's in trouble. John the Baptist said in Luke 3.11, He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none, and he who has food, let him do likewise. I began reading a book uh, Vern Thomason loaned me. It's about uh, World War II POWs both on the Allied side and on the German side. Uh, we had German POWs here in America. And, uh, one of the, and I just started the book, but he said one of the things that helped people to get along and survive in concentration camps and in prison camps was that they showed kindness to each other. And their rations were no good in most cases, and but when they would share their food with another prisoner, that helped both of them realize the importance of life and to do their best to survive. Even when you don't have much, whatever you share with someone else gives you the courage and blesses you and helps you to survive. Well, when the apostolic age had passed... And the church began to, to decline a little bit. Basil the Great urged for men. He told them to forsake this mysticism. And he said, you need to begin working hard for other people. And this is what he said in one sermon. He said, the bread that you store up belongs to the hungry. The cloak that lies in your chest belongs to the naked. And the gold that you have hidden in the ground belongs to the poor. In other words, what you have... You try to use to be a blessing to somebody else. By the way, just want to say thank you for what you gave to missions this past month. I think, if I'm not mistaken, we sent in over $600 uh, to missions. Some of you helped this little girl, Grace Bass, who is moving here. You tried to be a blessing to her, to be a blessing to others that she ministers to. Thank you for what you're doing in that respect. Could I remind you, just keep it up and do it with your neighbors. Do it when you're going through the line at Taco Bell. And say to the person when you get up to the window to get your order, could I pay for the person back behind me? And be sure and leave them a gospel track and hand that to them. Say, give this to the car behind me and just say thanks. You... You wouldn't believe how maybe serving somebody else in that little way would make a difference in their lives. We met a lady this week. We went to eat at a little restaurant, and this lady was from South Carolina. She said she told us that her husband had died, and he'd 
passed away seven years ago, and she just decided she would pack up and move to where her sister was, all the way from South Carolina to Arizona. Now, one of the things in South Carolina that is kind of a unique thing to South Carolina is chicken bog. You know what chicken bog is? Does it taste good? Uh, it depends on who you ask and who fixes it. But chicken bog has everything. It's got rice and chicken and shrimp and all kinds of stuff in it. And it, I don't know why they call it chicken bog. Maybe if you ever got stuck in it, you'd never get out. I don't know. But it tastes pretty good. But we just talked to her a little bit about it, invited her. And I, I always try to leave a good tip for those that serve me. And I always try to thank them. So I took out one of my business cards and I wrote on the back and wrote her name. And I said, uh, thank you for serving us. I said, I hope you'll come and see us sometime. Left her a gospel tract and left her twice the tip that she deserved. Why? Just to be nice. And we welcomed her to Arizona and said, we hope you love it here. She said, we said, have you been through a summer yet? She said, yeah, I got here last summer. I said, well, you'll, by wintertime, you'll realize why people stay here. <laughs> but here's the thing. It doesn't take but a few minutes to just be nice to somebody. Our text shows us that the full expression of the outgoing of the heart toward others. It's a, it's a common thing to look for someone's need for food or for clothing or whatever it is, but it's evident that when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you do your best to try to meet the physical needs of those around you. And I think that's important. The believer must give him to us to serve the mental and moral and social and psychological and physical needs of others. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 23, But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, life becomes unbearable for people when they see no hope. And um, at the... Uh, when I play racquetball, we were, we were playing on outdoor courts for a while over at Desert Ridge High School. And I'd, I'd walk in and they'd say, uh, uh, Howard, what's the good word today? And every time I'd say, hope. And it, this past week, one of the guys that asked me that said, what's the good word? I said, you know, don't you? He said, yeah, hope. Hope. People live hopeless lives. They see no way out of the predicament they're in, whether it's financial reverses, whether it's addictions to some sort of problem, uh, some uh, drug or alcohol or whatever it might be. They see no hope. And life gets to be dark for them so much that depression and disease and worry crowd them so much that they're even thinking of taking their own lives. That's when God's people can step up. That's when we can shine a light in a dark place where somebody can see Jesus in us. The only cure for these weak souls is to bring them to Jesus. Just like, I don't know, I, we went to um, Noel, Missouri. Did anybody know where Noel, Missouri is? It's not the end of the world, but you can just about see it from there. <laughs> it's just this little wide spot in the road, and there's some, there's some caverns there. And as a Cub Scout, we loaded up in one of my dad's cattle trucks. And so all these Cub Scouts were sitting in the back of this big cattle truck, and we drove to Noel, Missouri. That's all. We didn't have a bus, so we took dad's cattle truck. We got there, and they took us down in this cave. And when we got in the bottom of the cave, you know what they did? They turned the lights out. I mean, you could not see your hand in front of your face. You talk about the darkness of dark, and then one guy had a little flashlight, and he turned it on. And it lit up that whole cavern, that whole room that we were in. A believer is like a little flashlight in a dark place, that if you let the light of the Lord Jesus show through you, listen, if you live for Jesus, he'll leak out of you every now and then. Amen? 
I mean, you can't help it, but He'll leak out if you live for Him. And you can be a light in a dark place. We must bring that balance of love toward God and love toward men and do our best to help others. But there's one final thing that I want you to see. Not only is unselfishness not natural, and we are unloving apart from Jesus, but God wants us to live an unnatural, supernatural life. You say, how is that possible? Look at verse 15, if you would. Now may the God of patience... And comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another. Stop there for just a moment. May the God of patience and comfort. Uh, Could I ask you, don't raise your hand, but would your family say you're a patient person? Just think about it. Are you a patient person? Now, may I remind you that... uh, You don't pray for patience because the Bible says that tribulation works patience. So when you pray for patience, you're asking for trouble, right? So trouble comes along and you learn to endure trouble patiently, right? So here's the thing. Notice what it says. May the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like Jesus. You see, here's the thing. God is very patient with us. He is long-suffering to us, where the Bible says in 1 Peter, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is patient with us. You see, if we got what we deserve, we, God would have wiped us off the earth a long time ago. But He's patient, and He is the God of comfort, and He allows us To be like-minded, like Jesus, toward one another. According to Christ Jesus, that, notice verse 6, that you may be with one mind, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The life that is outlined in this passage of Scripture is an unnatural, supernatural life. The natural man does not understand this. He looks on his own self. He thinks, i got to get what I can and can what I get and not let anybody get it and hide it so nobody can have it. That's the way the natural man is. You see, the world mocks true generosity and true benevolence toward other people. It mocks that because the world can't understand a life in service to others. The things of the Spirit of God our foolishness to them. I, I think about Amy Carmichael, who went to India as a missionary. And one thing about Amy Carmichael, she had always wished all her life that she could have blue eyes. Well, you know, today she could have blue eyes. Just order blue contact lenses, pop them in, you got blue eyes, right? But she had brown eyes. And she had longed for blue eyes when she was a child, but she gets to India And what does she do? She goes to the temples where these young girls, 10 to 14 years old, were taken to this temple and used as prostitutes in a worship to false gods. So what does Amy do? She gets over there and she uses coffee grounds and wipes her body with coffee grounds to darken her skin. And then she's grateful to God that she doesn't have blue eyes. Because her brown eyes allow her to pass for one of the other girls and go into the temple. And she rescued some of those young girls from a life of prostitution and immorality. And gave them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a servant she was. What a... What a person who gives her life in service to other people. Those things, the Bible says, are foolishness to the average person. But the truth is, the believer who seeks to obey this verse will find himself walking alone with God. Because the world does not look at life that way. Listen, if you live your life Pleasing others and not yourself, you will become more and more like Jesus. And when you become more and more like Jesus, the world will push you away. 
Love makes it possible for us to live with people that we don't like. If you don't believe that, just ask me. So, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, there are things that happen sometimes in life that kind of help you to know some things that maybe the average person doesn't know. Uh, I had the privilege of staying with a friend when I was in school. They didn't have running water at their home. And uh, they, didn't have, they didn't have a bathroom in their house. They had a, a path to the outhouse. And uh, I had the privilege of going to stay with them. And uh, I remember going to visit my grandparents, and uh, uh, they were all excited when they, when they uh, put carpet in the bathroom. And they were excited, and they liked it so much, they ran it all the way to the house. So uh, just, uh, but <laughs> I'm kidding about that, but my grandparents did have an outhouse for a long time. And, you, you know, we think about that and, and how, how rustic and how, how unsanitary and, all, uh, you know, we think about how, how can anybody live a lot of most of the world lives just like that. And yet, God has been so good to us. The text tells us that we ought to bear with those that are weak. The English word for ought is an interesting word. It means to owe. If we possess somebody else's property, we owe it to them. We ought to pay. Owe and ought, is, though it has a different sound in speech, as far as English is concerned, it has the same spiritual pronunciation. Because of Jesus, we owe it. And because of Jesus Christ, we ought to love and to bear with one another. The Greek word here is the first person for ego. To be selfish is to be egotistical. That's what we talk about, that a person has a big ego. But Jesus... The text says that Jesus did not please himself, but he moved to serve other people. And that's what we're to do. We live in a selfish world, don't we, folks? We live in a world that uh, is marked by me first. And, um, you know, we look on the side of the road from time to time and we'll see an accident and we see the death toll rising because of uh, people driving crazy. You, you know, have you ever had someone come up along to you and honk at you and then they, you know, they roll their window down and they give you that half a peace sign salute, you know, and, and, uh, and, and they're just so aggravated because they believe they deserve that spot, the pavement, and you kept them from it. And they're going to make it at least a half a second faster than you to wherever there is they're going. They glare at you and they make obscene gestures to you. And whenever a believer has an opportunity, you know, I, I've, I've accidentally cut folks off in traffic, not meaning to. And, you know, and I'll try to, when, when somebody lets me in, you know, I'll wave at them and say thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I want to try to be the kind of person that uh, I think Jesus would be if he would ever drive a car. I want to drive like Jesus, don't you? Not like Jehu, who drove furiously, the Bible says, but like Jesus, who would be kind and allow... Listen, it, just being nice to people. Boy, we have a lack of that in this world. Even when a person becomes a believer, the old human nature is still there, and there is a war going on between us, between the flesh and the spirit. There were two people in the church at Philippi that got at odds with each other. And Paul sent a young man named Timothy there to try to help them work it out. And because he sent Timothy, notice what he said in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 21. For all seek their own, not the things which are, which are of Christ. And so the purpose in us 
trying to be good to other people and be nice to other people is because everybody needs somebody to help them from time to time. Listen, I'm going to, those of you will recognize this, but this is the way a lot of people are. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. And when it's not going our way, we got a lousy feeling. Frank Sinatra is known for a song that he said, I did it my way. We want our way. The Bible tells us in Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Anybody like me? I can get along with anybody as long as you do it my way. We want our way. We want our way in our home. We want our way at work. We want our way on the freeway when we're driving. We want our way at the restaurant. We want our way. And yet, the Bible says, the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. See here, Jesus did not please himself. He he wasn't looking for his way. He was following the Father's way. Why did he choose the will of the Father rather than taking it easier on himself? Why? Because Jesus wanted to please the Father. And he made himself submissive to the Father, and he went to the cross on our behalf. One passage of scripture and I'll close. In John chapter 14, these are the words of Jesus in the upper room. These things have I spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will bring to your remembrance the things that I've said to you. Do you know the disciples forgot When Jesus died, they forgot what Jesus had told them. He said, after three days, I'll rise again. They forgot about that. And they decided they were going to go back to do what they were doing before they ever met Jesus. Peter went to go fishing, right? And so, notice he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you... I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And, and now I have told you before it comes that when it, does not come, when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But look, look at verse 31. But that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. All of us have a responsibility to do our best to live for Jesus. All of us have a responsibility in living for Jesus To let him leak out of us and to spill out on other people. Somebody you can serve today. Maybe those of you that are going to go out to eat. Instead of complaining about the service. Griping that your food's not exactly right. Maybe you can say, I'll do my best to. Be nice to the one who's serving me. And maybe you'll give a little extra because you don't know what they're going through. And maybe as you're going through the line and you're in the drive through you look and see maybe a rattle trap of a car behind you. Somebody's just trying to get by and Maybe you can do something to help them and show Jesus' love to them by getting their meal this time. Maybe that neighbor who's struggling with 
trying to get things unloaded from their car after coming back from the grocery store. You, you could go lend a hand. Maybe that person who's having an awkward time trying to get the bottled water that they need to take home, getting on that cart, maybe you could go lend a hand and just be nice. I don't think Disney movies are always scriptural. They're not, but I do remember one. Uh, I believe it was Bambi. I don't know what chapter and verse, but one of them said, if you can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all. In some cases, that's biblical. Uh, scripture tells us it's better to keep silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> Just try to live like Jesus. It's unnatural to live that way. You know, it's, it's unnatural to open the door for others. It's unnatural to let somebody in line ahead of you. It's unnatural to give when you think you don't have it to give. But it's the right thing to do to serve others. I hope. This week. Wanted to, could I tell you what one church did? And I thought about doing this sometime. They took some of their offering and they gave everybody in the church $10 out of the church offering. They just handed it out. said, we're giving money today. I want you to take that money and you go be Jesus to somebody and give that money to somebody else's need. And then you come back and tell us about it. I'd like to do that sometime. Just see what. But I tell you what we can do without even dipping in the offering. We could take what we got. Kind of hard to open this, isn't it? <laughs> Pull out what we got. Give it to somebody else. That's one way to serve. That's one way to wash someone's feet. That's one way to do what Jesus says when he says that we're not our own. We belong to him. Let's stand for prayer. But I want to wash some feet. So if anybody needs a stick like this, I will make you one. It's a tag-along. I call them tag-along sticks. And it's just a walking stick. It's not the Jesus type because he wore the staff. Or, uh, walked a shepherd's the staff. staff along yeah. But this is about like this. You can come and you can stand and talk to somebody and lean on it. <laughs> It'll help you go down a hill, come up a hill. Amen. But if you would like to have one, I will make it. I let, made let him 20, know. Uh, 27 of them through the virus. You saw the one with the snake on it at the, at the house. Uh, some of them I've sold for $100. Uh, Everybody knows what an agave is. The, the century plant has that long stem. Oh, yeah. I make sticks out of those. They're $100. This is $50. I was going to sell this to Kim today for $30, but I'm giving them away washing feet. There you go. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Let's pray, all right? Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you. Thank you for this example of a one who wants to wash another's feet. 
I ask, Lord, that you would help us all to put this into practice today. And may this week we watch for opportunities to serve another. May we bear the failings of the weak. It's unnatural. Generally speaking, we are not loving toward others. It's a supernatural life that you can live through us if we let you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated just a moment. Pastor Matt's going to come and make some announcements. Just wanted to mention something. Some of you had signed up or said that on your connection cards that you're interested in Financial Peace University. After service is over, I'm going to stand right here at the front. If, you, if there are some of you that would be interested in going through Financial Peace University, would you meet me here? I'd like to talk with you about a time that would work for you uh, to do that, and we'll talk about that after service is over. So I'm just going to stay up here, and when we're dismissed, you'll meet me up here. We'll talk about Financial Peace University and when it'd be a good time for you. And along with that, we'll close with our offering. We want to thank you for your faithfulness and giving. And we do have the offering box over here on the table with the blue tablecloth. If you want to give any kind of physical means today, envelopes or uh, any kind of cash or check, you can give that way. Easiest way to give is just go through our website, the donate tab there at the top of our website. And uh, we have text to giving and other means. Just want to make everything available. And thank you for your giving. 2021 has been so far our strongest financial year ever. And uh, in the midst of all the the challenges and everything, we, we give God the credit for that because there's no human explanation whatsoever. So I uh, do want to remind you on the table with the white tablecloth is sign up for potluck this Saturday if you want to bring something to Brother David's end time session. And there's also camp forms. If you're a young person interested in going to camp, grab one of those and we'll try to get those filled out in the next couple of weeks. Let's all stand as we get ready to close in prayer. Remember our 40 days, please, that go through uh, day 40 is ending this week. If you want to end your fast, that's between you and the Lord, but uh, we are asking if people would be willing to maybe go a couple more days, at least through to the middle of next week, please. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word and what it teaches. And Lord, sometimes there's hard passages, there's challenging things that go against our sinful nature, and things we can't accomplish in our own strength, but Lord, with the power of your Holy Spirit that we can and not only have love toward those that are similar to us in our own congregation and in our own fellowship, but, Lord, that the example of your children would be that they would love their enemies and they would love those that are different and those that are outside of their group. May you help us to take advantage of that. Help us to be open and yielding to your spirit. May you bring opportunities to us to be a witness, to be kind to people, and we know some of those will be a chance to open the door to share the gospel and share what Jesus has done in our lives. May be with us throughout all this week. In Jesus' name, amen.